salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad another salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad for the sake of all of us who wish to be in Karbala next year insha'Allah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen was salatu was salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin habibi ilahil alamin abil qasim al mustafa muhammad allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi at tayyibin at tahirin al ma'sumin al madlumin al ghur al mayamin الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرسا تحرهم تطحيرا اللهم صل على محمد آل محمد السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا ابن حبيب الله السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء السلام عليك يا مولا يا أبا عبد الله الحسين الشهيد الأتشان المظلوم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات اللهم صل على محمد Wa'ali Muhammad, respected brothers and sisters, respected elders, lovers and mourners of the symbol of justice and unity, the symbol of human rights, the barometer of human rights, Sayyidi Shuhada, Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, greetings to each and every one of you. We extend yet again, as we have been doing for close on to 40 days now, we extend our condolences to the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, the avenger of the tragedy of Karbala and the injustice that has been brought upon Ahlul Bayt in the build up to Karbala the son of Zahra, during these final days and nights of tears, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having allowed us to be alive and to be healthy from Yawmul Ashura up until now, so that we can also have an opportunity to, to reflect but also to console to console the grieving heart of our mother Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, to console the grieving heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, to console the grieving heart of Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salam. Forty days, approximately forty days after that Ashura, that Yawmil Ashura, which is like no other day, and we will always repeat. And it is like no other day, no other day of oppression and of violation can be compared to Ashura. No place can be compared to Karbala. As stated by Imam Hassan alayhi salam, when he told about Abdullah al Hussein, when he was overcome by the poison, by the poison that was forced by Muawiyah, La'natullah alayhi, when Imam Hussein after that had to face arrows, or when all Imam Hassan wanted was just to be buried near Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Such pain, such anguish, but even that could not compare to Karbala. Because in, because in Medina al Munawwara at Baqi, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, when he was carrying the body of his brother to be buried, he faced the arrows, but those arrows didn't pierce the throat of his infant. Those arrows didn't lead to his death. Those, arrow, those arrows didn't fill his body. That did not happen in Medina when Imam al Hassan was poisoned. And when certain figures in Islamic history 
humiliated his procession. It did not happen in Karbala. In Karbala, those arrows pierced the throat of Imam's infant. We ask our mother, as we saw in the beautiful documentary, and really may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless those who put it together. It was really moving. We ask our mother Zahra alayhi salam to invite us insha'Allah next year to visit her beloved Hussein, to have the opportunity to not only console her while we are here in Cape Town and in South Africa, but to console her in Karbala during these days of what is most certainly and brothers and sisters have been, and we don't need to repeat because you all have your own experiences, the most beautiful human gathering in the world. As Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, Verily Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, attends the visitors of her son al Hussein and seeks God's forgiveness for their sins. May she be, inshallah, with those zuwar who are there currently and keep them safe. Brothers and sisters, in our geopolitical reality currently, and even in our own country, human rights has become quite a buzzword, an oft-used term. So much so that even the blatant violators of people's rights, the blatant violators of the rights of nations, they try to cover up their misdeeds and the interference in the name of fighting for human rights. But from the perspective of the religion of Islam and the prophetic perspective, the rights of human beings have been, have been a central concern right from the very beginning. The Holy Quran declares in, a very emphatic, in, in very emphatic words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desired to show favor upon those who are oppressed in the land and make them leaders. Surah Qasas is clear. While Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam has also emphasized huququl ibad regularly, the rights and rights of various categories of human beings and people and relations. And following in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, his beloved son, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, took to the plains of Karbala to raise a voice for these very rights and to confront head on the Umayyad challenge to Islam's egalitarian order. Umayyad challenge to that egalitarian order was a manifestation. We must always remember human rights and the rights of the oppressed and the rights of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam were not only trampled upon by Banu Umayyah. Banu Umayyah's trampling thereupon was a culmination of something that had occurred before. While some revisionists and enemies of Ahlul Bayt, the Nawasib, they, they never get tired of saying that Karbala was purely a struggle for power. Imam Hussein himself clarified. This, that they, and even, even at times, even some of us, when we speak about Karbala and given the context, political context that we are in in the globe, we tend to speak about Karbala at times, sadly, within the context of political power and the power that we want to gain. Uh, but Imam Hussein alayhi salam clarified in his sermon when he says that, Ya Allah, O oh God, everything we did was not prompted by rivalry for political power, nor for a search for wealth and abundance. Rather, it was done to demonstrate to men the shining principles and values of your religion. Indeed, brothers and sisters, Karbala was a battle for these very values, a stand for the weak and oppressed against the arrogant and the vain, one aspect of Karbala. The fact of the battle, the facts of the battle, each and every small aspect, which I'm sure during Muharram Maulana has outlined, and its tragic aftermath, what has happened afterwards, how even those who are madhloom and oppressed from the family of Rasulullah engaged with people afterwards. All of that reflects that Karbala, that, that, that it was a stand for the weak and oppressed against the arrogant and vain. 
Karbala by the beauty displayed, as I said, by its victims. The beauty displayed by Abu Abdullah al-Hussein even right till the very end when he tried his, when he wanted to prevent fighting, not so that his own body could be saved and his family could be saved, but so that those who are fighting him could be saved from Jahannam. So that beauty displayed by its very victims and the evil shown by the violators we saw, we don't even need to describe the kind of levels of worse than animal behavior that was displayed. That actually signaled and continues to represent the victory over the violation of the rights of Rasulullah and his Ahlul Bayt by this very Ummah. Even now, even now we use Karbala as an entry point. We use the opportunity of speaking about Karbala as an entry point to speak about how the concept of humanity, the concept of human rights, the concept even of rights of Rasulullah and what he left behind has been violated. As I said, Karbala is the culmination, but it represents it at its very peak. In fact, in fact, we can even go as far as to say that Karbala makes us understand really why Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam are the heirs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. It makes us understand when you see who did what in Karbala, whose children they were. Not only Yazid, but there were others who were also children of people who trampled upon the rights of the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And on the very dignity of what Islam is about, when we see all of that playing itself out in Karbala, we then understand Islamic history as a whole. In Ziyarat Ashura, Imam Baqir salam was present in Karbala, in fact, takes us through the many lines. And I think brothers and sisters have the opportunity and have been reciting, mashallah, takes us to the roots of Karbala, to the roots by condemning those oppressors who have led to what has happened, the originators. And the respected brothers and sisters, one of the key witnesses of Karbala, Ali ibn al Hussein, our fourth Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, who could not participate in the combat due to his illness, has actually discussed the issue of rights in a very lucid and succinct manner after the tragedy that befell on his family on Ashura. Imam Sajjad alayhi salam's contribution to rebuilding what we can deem as the edifice of Islamic ethics and spirituality through its du'as as recorded in Sahifa Sajjadiyah after the Karbala tragedy is well known to all. But the Imam, fourth Imam, the inheritor of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam has also discussed in depth the question of rights in a document which is known as Risalat al hukuq the treaties on rights. It's very important that in particular in our current context that we familiarize ourselves with that particular document and we also utilize it as a way of showing the beauty of Ahlul Bayt in this important discussion on human rights. Indeed, such a collection of Imam sayings as narrated by, by Sheikh Saduk, by someone of the standing of Sheikh Saduk is quite inspiring, especially considering that it was written uh, approximately during the 7th century and that too after our beloved Imam Zainul Abidin witnessed the severe human rights violation at Karbala and thereafter Could it, be, it was written there was a context in Risalat al hukuq brothers and sisters Imam Sajjad discusses multiple rights such as the rights even of the tongue the eyes the ears the rights of prayers which fall into the realm of ethics and morality while also discussing the rights of the ruled, the rights of women, the rights of the child, the rights of the neighbor. In an era where rights were trampled upon without any restraint, because remember even after Karbala, the Umayyads continued, Imam Sajjad made it clear using Quran and a hadith of his beloved grandfather and those who came before him 
where he made it clear using these as a barometer that from the most powerful segments of society to the weakest, slaves, children, women, all had rights which had to be respected. The right of the tongue, Imam Sajjad uh, says, is that you consider it too noble for obscenity, accustom it to do good, to good. And in an age where the treatment of women was far from ideal, the Imam advises that the right of your wife is that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made her a repose and comfort for you. So you should honor her and treat her gently. To encourage social cohesion and build community relations, Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam has said that the right of your neighbor is that you guard him when he is absent. Honor him when he is present and aid him when he is wronged. In our context in South Africa now, when we are speaking about street committees, neighborhood watches, and community policing forums, especially as crime reaches unbearable proportions, these lessons and teachings of Imam Sajjad salam become very important, even in terms of tackling crime. As for the mentoring of the youth, Imam Sajjad says the right of him who is younger is that you show compassion towards him through teaching him, pardoning him, covering his faults. And these are just a few examples, brothers and sisters, of the divinely inspired maxims of Imam Sajjad that are contained in Risalat al huquq It is a testament to the Imam's lofty character that he gave the Islamic world such gems after seeing his beloved father, brothers, kinsmen, supporters massacred by the merciless hordes of Bani Umayyah on the burning plains of Karbala. Moreover, this gentle soul, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, had to suffer the tribulation of having his aunts, the granddaughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, sisters, and other captives taken prisoners during, and when we remember it especially during these days of Arba'in, while he himself was made to march to Kufa, tied with chains around his neck, that when his son Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam prepares the body, prepares his body for burial, when he eventually is also poisoned by Banu Umayyah, you can say that there were marks, not only the marks on his father's body because he was carrying food to give to the poor, but they were the marks of the chains of Banu Umayyah. But Imam Sajjad proved through these spiritual gifts to the Ummah that he was, he, not that he needed to prove to anybody, but he proved to people, at least people could see that he was a worthy successor of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, Imam Ali alayhi salam and Rasulullah, guiding the masses and pointing people to the principles of Amr bin Ma'roof nahi anil munkar, even, other, even under the most trying of circumstances. Today, when we see many societies, including our own, devoid of rights. Yes, South Africa is a society with a human rights culture, with a beautiful constitution that we can, one can have critiques on various angles, but a functional constitution. But even here, Corruption, brothers and sisters, violates human rights. It violates people's dignity and access to that which is rightful to them. Crime violates human rights. When people see criminal activity from those that are supposed to lead them, it creates a sense of uh, desensitization. So these are violations against human rights. So gems such as Risalat al huquq point the way to what a better society based on mutual rights and responsibility can look like. Sadly, respected brothers and sisters, these rights that Imam Sajjad alayhi salam speaks of were so mercilessly trampled upon at Karbala. And we sadly either continue to trample upon these rights in our own way, in our own lives at times, or we remain silent when they are being trampled upon. We have a responsibility as followers of the great Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, to be very, very sensitive when it comes to rights.
he speaks of, and we've, and we've spoken about it, women's rights, the context of gender-based violence, rife, human trafficking is on the rise in our province. I attended a meeting yesterday, brothers and sisters, we're around the corner in Ravensmead, young girls from the age of 7 to 13 years age of age are being picked up before they go to school and they are being groomed and being trafficked. They are being so, so we have these realities in our community, in our society. The rights of children, we find our children are being violated. We find in Karbala, however, and we see how, how the, the forces of Bani Umayya immediately after the martyrdom of, of Abu Abdullah al Hussein sought to humiliate the children of Ahlul Bayt, how they treated Sukaina alayhi salam. We don't even want to narrate those incidences and repeat, but we've reflected. But we see on the other hand, Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, how they treated, how Zainab alayhi salam was a, was, was a source of consolation and peace for the children. How Abu Fadl al-Abbas, so much so he loves the children, that when he gets to the water of River Euphrates and he's able and he could have a chance to drink, he doesn't drink because he thinks of Sakina. This is the respect that they had for the rights of children. When food comes afterwards, they make sure that the children are the first ones to eat. But in our society, what happens? Even in families, when children, when things are due to children, you've got adults who may not even be family members taking that which belongs to the children, to the orphan in our society, even in the Muslim community where there's a disrespect, there's a violation of even the rights of the orphan who has nothing. They even humiliated the right of the dead body. We know how Abu Abdullah al-Hussein's body was trampled upon and looted. But as you find, Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam teach us a different tradition. When Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he tells, when he says to Muhassan, and Imam Hussein, how, how the body of Ibn Muljim must be treated. The rights of the tongue, the kind of obscene things that they said to Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, to say the Zainab in the court of Yazid, the way they even curse Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Whereas Ahlul Bayt always, even at Karbala, even the way Imam engaged was one with akhlaq, beautiful Words only came from the tongue, accompanied by Quran. The right of also worship, the right to freedom of religion, brothers and sisters, becomes very important. Because particularly in a society like ours, where, where in which the, 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 the dangers of cross materialism and extreme secularism are penetrating, creating a deep sense of immorality, an immorality that leads to those violations of human rights that we spoke about. In a society such as ours, religion becomes extremely important. Faith becomes extremely important. And I'm sure Brother Bashir will be touching more on that tomorrow night, inshallah. But the, 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 hence the protection and preservation of the right to practice the right for religious traditions and communities to practice their faith within their own traditional frameworks and sacred fr frameworks within their perspective is something that our constitution guarantees 100%. We even have got chapter 9 institutions that guarantee that. It is our responsibility, brothers and sisters, as those, because it's not only that we practice our religion within the context of that which has come down to us and that which we hold sacred for our sakes and to make us feel good and so that we can be guided in the context of all of this corruption that's around us. No, we do it and we need to champion it so that society, not that they become followers of the religions that we are following, not that we want that essentially, but so that society, the moral fiber of society can be regenerated 
society is able to draw on the beautiful tradition that we have to offer of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. These hukuk that Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam speaks about, the beautiful, the, the beauty we see in Karbala, the beauty we see of Fatima al-Zahra, the beautiful akhlaq and teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But in order for us to be able to promote that, we need to ensure that we are proud of expressing that, of expressing our tradition and practicing it, and our constitution allows for that. We must not allow, brothers and sisters, we must not allow those others who are able to benefit fully from the human rights culture that many have given their blood for in this country, including Muslims, including followers of this beautiful school of Ahlul Bayt salam, who fought against the apartheid regime. We allow those rights that have been fought for not only to be, you, uh, to be violated, but for them to be abused even in the name of expression of religious freedoms. They want to curb what we have in a Muslim community. Muslim community where people will say, no, as Muslims we have the right to practice. Beautiful. And we should fight for those rights. But we're inside of the Muslim community. The diversity in the Muslim community is not tolerated by those in the mainstream. We need to find ways and means consistently, particularly as followers of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, to ensure that our rights are protected within that particular context. And I think the stance that has been taken even on the issue of the Verlam matter, by Ahlul Bayt Foundation of South Africa, they needs to be commended and needs to be supported at all material times. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, when she stands in the court of Yazid, and even on the way to the court of Yazid, protects this identity, this identity of love of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and following of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam in the midst of Yazid. When Yazid said, I wish my ancestors were here to see how the enemies are in fear. They would be happy and they would tell me, Yazid, you did a good job. Astaghfirullah, we find today people praising Yazid and praising the father of Yazid and saying Sahaba and Tabi'een. But when Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam hears this, she says, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger. And then she says, oh Yazid, you think you have turned the whole world against us and you have driven us like slaves. You think that you have honor and you are important. You are holding your nose high and you are happy for the world is easy for you and your kingdom is secure. But you just wait and see. And she says, O oh son of Tulaqa, to honor your slaves and drive the children of the Prophet as slaves? She questions him and she says, you expose their privacy. You expose their faces. She tells a story. She speaks the truth to power. You pardoned them. You, you paraded them from city to city. They had no one to protect them. And everyone near or far examining their faces. What can we expect from a descendant of those who try to eat the liver of the righteous people? whose flesh grows from the blood of martyrs. What can we expect from someone who grew up with the hatred of the family of the Prophet? Then she, she quotes Yazid's poem. And I'm not going to quote the entire narration of Asayda Zainab, but she says, you call your ancestors. And she says, indeed, you will soon go the same way as them. Indeed, you will wish you were mute and did not say what you said and did not do what you did. She says, by God, you cannot eradicate our memory. And here we are commemorating the memory of Ahlul Bayt remains alive because they were proud in spite of the difficult conditions. Sayyidah Zainab was proud and spoke truth to power and reflected the tradition. And you cannot eradicate the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the shame of this will not leave you your view is in vain and your days are numbered and your groups will be scattered. And we ask Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala to complete the reward for them and in, in, 
and increase for them and make us the successful ones. Indeed, He is merciful and kind and God is sufficient and the best of protectors. There's an entire sermon and I think it's good that we study it, inshallah. Our identity and beliefs, as I said, is what drives us to stand up for human rights. It's what we share with those around us. Not hiding where there is no benefit. Yes, being strategic, being smart, but not to hide and duck and dive when there is no benefit for the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. We must not compromise. We must not compromise our respect for the rights of people through our akhlaq and our ability to openly express our beliefs. Obviously with respect and understanding. Whilst maintaining because others also have the right and interpretation to believe what they believe. We must be careful, brothers and sisters, and I, I've touched on it and we'll speak about it again. Islamic unity is extremely important. We need to maintain the unity with all brothers and sisters, not only amongst Muslims, but humanity. But we must be very careful in the context of the need to protect our identity and what this beautiful school stands for of the fake unity, attempts at fake unity, unity, political, pseudo-political unity for the sake of power mongering and protecting our own interests and our desires because then it becomes fake and it becomes wrong. When we want to go and we will even praise Salafis, those who hate Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam for the sake of political populism, and we even praise them for acts that they have done against rulers that we may disagree with. And we call for those same things to be done here. And we put in jeopardy the community of Ahlul Bayt followers in South Africa for the sake of wanting to come with some semblance of so-called revolutionary unity. Those things actually do more harm than good brothers and sisters. Whilst we have no problem on the other hand to curse our own ulama, to bring up issues of lies and fitna against our own leaders, but wanting to at the same time hide beliefs and be apologetic here and there on certain things. We must know that Imam Sahib al Asri was Zaman is knowledgeable of this. We should be proud, brothers and sisters, obviously within reason. In fact, in fact, in my understanding and from what we learn from Karbala. And what we see even around the beauty of commemorating Karbala and Arba'in, the best way to actually build bridges is to be transparent with respect, but to ensure that we act at all times with the akhlaq and beautiful conduct that Ahlul Bayt has left for us. That we even are champions of the rights of others. That we try to bring hearts together around the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Because if we do that, if we do that, then those even of other schools of thought will understand why we do and say certain so-called contentious things. They may not agree, but they will understand, no, it comes from an angle of love. Because love of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, understanding of their values and culture is something that we are promoting, that we're having in common. So, for example, also, when we find that even ulama in the broader society who are not of the Shia school of thought are taking a stance of protecting the izzah and honor of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and they speak against Muawiyah la'natullah alayhi they, they speak against him and then they find themselves being insulted it becomes our responsibility to actually be, in, be and stand in their defense that is unity that is unity of purpose is not some fake political unity that is put out there just to impress certain individuals. We saw what has happened. I mean, everybody knows about AIM Islam in the UK, Ahlul Bayt Islamic Mission in the UK. And what has happened? They built up a relationship in with all sincerity with a certain uh, group in the light of political struggles, very important. But that very group has now been condemning Ahlul Bayt, followers of Ahlul Bayt, disrespecting the Ahlul Bayt, 
and they've been forced to break their relations with them. We don't want to have those, but I think it's, it, it's important that we build unity of purpose, unity on the basis of common love for Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, and just the way in which we treat people. We know, for example, when people come here, and that is one thing that attracts everybody, many people who have come from outside. I've seen people who have come most vehemently anti-Shia, but they would come on Ashura, or they would come for a program, and then they are attended to as guests of honor. Their seat is given to them. They are seen, have you eaten? Those simple things, they are spoken to beautifully, and their perception and view starts to change. That is the way in which we build true unity of the hearts. And brothers and sisters, Arba'in, this beautiful walk of Arba'in represents this beautiful approach. It's a university, really. When you go there, and inshallah, those who haven't been there, we pray on these nights that you are transported there, inshallah. And that those who have been there, that we can go again, inshallah. Really, you see that true love and care that Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam presents. People are poor. Iraq hardly has any infrastructure. Really, it's a, it's, it's, it's a country that is under major siege. Legacy of Saddam, legacy of a corrupt state, various things. But still, even within that context, we find that people, no matter how poor they are, they share. They have these mawakib on the side offering tea. And one feels so hurt if you don't take something. You feel as if you are hurting them. They feel, in fact, we find there, there was one incident that we know where even you find a young man carrying his old mother on his shoulders from Najaf to Karbala just because the mother taught him about loving Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. People go out of their way. It represents really that akhlaq that this particular beautiful school is all about. And hence you found even that even here in South Africa, people when they've read and they've seen people have gone to Arba'in, those who are not even followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, but admirers and lovers wish to go, wish to be part of that experience. And the way in which even now it's being positively written about we look at some of the websites, for example. Look at the website or the Facebook page of the Habibia Sufi Darbar in Peter Maritzburg. It's not Shia, but the way in which they've written about Arba'in and about those who are there, the millions who are there. Beautiful. It, that already automatically starts to be a bridge of unity that we can work on. It is for this baraka and reason and significance of Arba'in that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and a visitation to Abu Abdullah alayhi salam that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said the following in Kamil al-Ziyarat he said, Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our enemies have criticized our followers for going to our ziyara our visitation but that did not restrain them from coming to us and they went against our opponents so have mercy on faces changed by the sun in our love. Have mercy on those cheeks which were placed on the grave of Hussein alayhi salam. Have mercy on those eyes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on our eyes, inshallah, that have cried throughout all these days. Those eyes which have shed tears on us with sympathy. Have mercy on those hearts which have become restless and anxious and feeling burnt for us and have mercy on their loud cryings and screams for us. O oh Allah, I've entrusted bodies and souls to you till the day of great thirst, when you will quench their thirst with the hawth of Al-Kawthar. But there was no one to quench Abu Abdullah alayhi salam's thirst. There was no one to quench the thirst of Sukaina. Brothers and sisters, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, goes on to say in another narration, he says, whoever leaves his home aiming at visiting the grave of Hussein alayhi salam, if he is on foot, Allah will write for him every footstep a good deed and will erase an evil for him until he reaches the ha'ir, the vicinity of the grave. 
Our beloved Sheikh Al Mufid narrates from Imam Hassan Al Askari alayhi salam. And this is this, this is because Arba'in has those treasures. This is why our Imams have said that they said the signs of a believer of a Shia are five: praying the fifty-one rakaat daily. Insha'Allah, may we get to that point. Insha'Allah, ziyara of Arba'in, wearing the ring on the right hand, prostration on the soil, and pronouncing the Bismillah loudly. But Ziyara of Arba'in. Safwan, one of the trustworthy companions of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, narrated the visitation, the Ziyara of Arba'in for Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. So it means the significance. 40, it's not some innovation that have just emerged in popular culture. But because of this deep rooted tradition, that is why we see such beauty. And did not Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari? who was a prominent Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, along with Atiyah al-Awfi, who was also a prominent companion of Imam Ali alayhi salam, were they not the first main visitors who reported to the holy grave of Abu Abdullah al Hussein on Arba'in? At the time of the tragedy of Karbala, Jabir, who had an impaired vision, he was visually impaired due to age, was residing in Medina. And upon hearing the martyrdom of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam made a trip all the way to Kufa. Atiyah then narrates the story. He says, I left Kufa with Jabir on foot heading to Karbala to visit the holy grave of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. Note that today Kufa is part of the holy city of Najaf. So brothers and sisters, the visitation the Arba'in, even though we may be doing it here, it's deeply significant. It's, and, and that is why the beauty flows therefrom. But brothers and sisters, we have spoken, as we conclude, we have spoken about Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. We, we have commemorated Imam Sajjad alayhi salam in previous nights. We have spoken about that hukuk that he gives to humanity. We have benefited from Sahifa Sajjadiya and we've noted his role in Karbala, the leadership that he had shown. But brothers and sisters, Karbala and post Karbala, and particularly these days, and the days leading up to these days, were very, very tragic on the heart of our beloved, sweet Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam with the assistance of the tribesmen of that noble tribe, Banu Asad, angels and believers from the jinns narrated, identified the bodies and buried Imam Hussein's headless body along with that of the infant Ali al Azgar. At the foot of Imam Hussein, he buried Ali Akbar, he buried Abu Fadl al Abbas. What pain, what anguish and sadness the heart of As-Sajjad went through. According to Imam Baqir alayhi salam, Banu Asad used to come to Karbala after completing their work and they used to bury the bodies of martyrs. When Banu Asad got the headless body, trampled body, we said the human rights, the right of the dead body was not respected by these evil people of Banu Umayyah. As they got that headless and trampled body of Imam Hussein by the order of Sajjad, the people of the village of Ghadiriya were a group from among the tribe of Banu Asad, as we said, buried Abu Abdullah and his companions one day after they martyred them. And it is said that most of their graves were found prepared and white fowls were seen circumambulating them. In another place, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, how painful it was for him to even narrate this. He is reported to have said, my beloved father's body was trampled by the horses of Awajiya. His flesh was crushed in such a way like that of a, like that of a physician making medicine by crushing herbs. It is transmitted also from Sheikh Atusi where he says that the people of Banu Asad brought a fresh mat place and they placed it under the body of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. It is related that Imam Sajjad alayhi salam said that I, along with a group 
of slaves dug open the grave of Abba Abdullah al Hussein and saw fresh mat on which lay the body of Abba Abdullah while the fragrance of musk was emanating from it. Imam says that he kept that mat at its original place on which the body was laying and then he ordered that the earth be filled in the grave and water to be sprinkled upon it. When the body of Abba Abdullah al Hussein was discovered and when Imam Sajjad, brothers and sisters, try to carry it up as we bid farewell let us let us picture imam sajjad salam. we won't get this opportunity we don't know if we'll be around for another arba'in but inshallah allah preserve us when imam sajjad tried to carry it up all parts of that body fell down like that of a broken earthen pot Imam was continuously crying during the funeral of his father and he was struggling to carry all parts of the body in his hands. Mufadal narrates that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, that none of the body parts of Abba Abdullah al Hussein remained untouched by swords, lances and arrows. Imam Sajjad buried him in that condition that he put his body on his head like a bundle of wheat it says in one narration brothers and sisters this is what our imam went through for us for humanity for those who are oppressed to protect the rights of others this is the selfless imam that comes from rasulullah that's an inheritor of jesus of isa ibn maryam this is that imam alayhi salam brothers and sisters that imam sajjad after burying his father, he took some soil of his father's grave and tied it to his clothes and cried and moved towards Bani Asad. And he says, I am the Imam of your time. I am Ali ibn al Hussein. And he says, Congratulations to you. You shall not be terrified or blamed for not helping us. But this is that Imam that Imam Sajjad had to bury. That Imam for whom Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, unlike Ibrahim, unlike Ibrahim alayhi salam, who had Ismail replaced by an animal, Rasulullah had to sacrifice his beloved grandson, brothers and sisters. It is mentioned even in Abu Fadl al Abbas. So he buries Abu Abdullah, but then he has to bury Abu Fadl, Abu Fadl whom he looked up to as a protector. He had to bury him near the Furat. And it is mentioned that Imam collected the body parts of Abu Fadl al-Abbas, that valiant warrior, that Abbas, that Qamar Banu Hashim, in a bundle of straw and make it in a circular shape. It is narrated that Imam Sajjad salam was crying, crying profusely when he saw the body of his beloved uncle Abbas and was cursing the killers. And Imam dug out a small grave and buried him in the grave. And then Imam Sajjad alayhi salam is reported to have, to have said, he said, Oh uncle, oh uncle, would that you have seen the scene of torching tents? What would you have done had you seen the scene of torching tents? When all the women from the, from the progeny of Rasulullah, when my auntie Zainab, when Umm Kulthum, when Ruqayya were calling upon you, Ya Abbas. Brothers and sisters, what calamity Ahlul Bayt went through. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa saya'alamu alladhina dhalamu. Ayyu man qalibin yan qalibun. Respected brothers and sisters, as we call upon our respected and beloved leader, Mawlana Sayyid Aftab Haider, to address us, we... Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the visitation of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the shafa'a of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to keep us together, to keep our unity, to build unity amongst humanity around the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. But we also pray and we recite Surah Al Fatiha with a salawat for the, all those who have passed on in our community, but a special dua that we make for those who are ill, particularly the sister of 
our senior, our elder, Auntie Batul, the, who's not experiencing the best of health, we make a special dua through the one who was married, who was ill at Karbala, Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, with one salawat and then Surah Al-Fatiha, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farajahum fatiha.